I think what made the boarding house that Puente had very popular uh, with social workers and social agencies is the fact that she uh, opened her arms to all. All of Dorothea's boarders um, were receiving various kinds of benefits and she knew how to work the system. So if there was any way that they could get more, she would get more for them. The following video contains graphic and disturbing content, which may be upsetting for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. F Street was a quiet suburban area, very peaceful and serene. But the group of people on the porch of this house looked out of place. They had come for the weekly AA meeting, hosted by Dorothea Puente, the owner of the house. She was 57 years old, but she looked older with her white hair and wrinkled face. She greeted them with a warm smile and invited them inside for coffee and donuts, always remembering their names and stories. Dorothea seemed like a kind and generous woman who cared about helping others, and the group respected and admired her, calling her Granny or Auntie. The smell of freshly brewed coffee wafted in from the kitchen, but some of them still craved a drink. The house on F Street was also a boarding house where Dorothea took in downtrodden people. But she accepted those that other homes wouldn't, welcoming those who struggled with mental health issues, addiction, or had criminal records. She helped them navigate the social services system, making sure they got their state and federal benefits, and encouraged them to get back on their feet. The local social workers were glad to refer people to her home and thankful that she took these people in. Dorothea had a horrible childhood. Her parents were alcoholics who abused and neglected her. She bounced from one foster home to another, facing more trauma and misery. She resorted to sex work to survive and married a former client when she was only 16. Fred was a 22-year-old soldier who had just come back from World War II. He offered Dorothea a chance to escape her past and start over. Motherhood was no better for Dorothea. She ignored her first child who was affected by her drinking during and after the pregnancy. She never showed any love or concern for the baby, who was often left in filthy diapers. The only person who cared for the child was Fred's mother. Dorothea got pregnant again and secretly gave the baby up for adoption. Her marriage with Fred soon collapsed. She relocated to California, where she invented a lie that she was a widow who had lost her young husband to a heart attack. She resumed her sex work, but at a new twist, she would rob her clients after seducing them. This scheme did not last long, as she was caught and sent to prison at age 19. In prison, she learned more criminal skills, such as forging checks and how to manipulate people and avoid detection. She also fabricated fake backstories about her heritage and used aliases when it suited her. When she got out of prison after four months, she moved to another city and went back to her old ways, but more savvy this time. After prison, she didn't stop her criminal activities, nor her search for financial stability. Another pregnancy, another adoption. Eventually, she met a new man, a sailor who was often away at sea. They got married and moved to a suburban home, but Dorothea was not satisfied. She drank a lot and spent his money. She brought home strangers from bars while he was gone. The neighbors noticed and gossiped. When her husband found out, he had her committed to a hospital to treat her alcoholism. The state's eugenics program sterilized Dorothea while she was there. They did this to people with mental illnesses and disabilities. They said she had schizophrenia, and that was why she lied and didn't care about others. Back then, they didn't know about narcissism and psychopathy as separate disorders. Most behaviors were considered symptoms of schizophrenia. The hospital told Dorothea to quit drinking, and she returned home to her husband. He did his best to look after her, but he had to go away for his job as a sailor. 
One day he came back to an empty house. She had left him and their home and moved to another city. There she began a new chapter of her life, a chapter full of more lies and more crime. Sacramento was Dorothea's new home, but she didn't change her old ways. She rented a house and turned it into a brothel, but the police soon raided it and sent her back to prison for 90 days. She had no home to return to when she was released, so she was arrested again for vagrancy. She spent another 90 days in jail. She had a trick up her sleeve this time, though. She had once made up a story that she was a holistic doctor, so she studied some medical books to back it up. She used this fake credential to get a job as a live-in nurse's aide, caring for elderly and disabled people. She had found new targets to exploit. Dorothea was a skilled aide, and she gained the trust of her clients. But she also used her criminal skills to exploit them. She cooked for herself with their food, claiming to keep them company because they were lonely. She stole their pills, their booze, and their money while cleaning their homes. She helped them with their errands and banking, depositing their retirement checks, but skimming a little for herself. She preyed on the more disabled or sick clients, who were more susceptible to her manipulation or to the effects of medication. She sometimes over-medicated them to make them more docile or drowsy. She quit her job before anyone caught on to her scheme. Dorothea had a knack for charming people, and she used it to her advantage. She pretended to be of Mexican descent and spoke some Spanish. She made friends with the local Hispanic community and got their help to renovate a house that she wanted to turn into a boarding house. She said she wanted to help the elderly and disabled, and many people believed her. She hired undocumented workers who could work off the books. She began a relationship with one of these men. He was 20 years younger than her, and he became her full-time handyman. She finally opened the boarding house and took in many tenants. The social workers knew she wasn't licensed, but they saw her doing so much for the community that it didn't matter. Dorothea became more involved in civic and charity work, earning the respect of the community. She also became more greedy, taking in a portion of the benefit checks of her boarders. Her young lover was not faithful to her, preferring women his own age. Dorothea tolerated this while he was working on the house and maintaining a good image, but he eventually left her. The community felt sorry for her and didn't suspect anything when she was seen with different older men. She used the money she stole to dress herself as a glamorous and well-put-together older lady, attracting the attention of these men. But she had a sinister motive. She was drugging and robbing them. One man, Pedro, escaped her plan to drug and rob him, and she developed feelings for him. She managed to convince him to marry her. She ignored the fact that she was still legally married to another man. She brought Pedro into her house, but he was violent and alcoholic. He abandoned her after only two months. Dorothea had enough of relationships by then, so she devised a new strategy with her dates. She would collect enough information about these men to redirect their retirement checks to her account. They went unnoticed among the benefit checks from her boarders. Dorothea invested the money she had stolen to start a business with a woman named Ruth. Ruth's husband was terminally ill and she had to give up her home to cover his medical expenses. She was grateful to Dorothea who offered her a room in her boarding house. She considered Dorothea her new friend and business partner and trusted her completely. But Dorothea's crimes were not going unnoticed. The police were receiving complaints about the check fraud and they were looking into her. Dorothea had a sinister plan for Ruth. She secretly mixed Ruth's medications into her drinks, making them more potent and harmful. Ruth gradually declined, feeling weak and exhausted. Dorothea pretended to comfort her giving her alcoholic cocktails to, quote, soothe her nerves. Ruth's son came to see her when he learned she was sick. He was alarmed by her condition, but Ruth told him that Dorothea was a nurse and was looking after her. He reluctantly went back home, feeling doubtful and uneasy. Dorothea was draining Ruth's money while she was slowly poisoning her. She moved money from Ruth's savings account to the account they shared for the cafe. 
Sadly, Ruth passed away in April of 1982. Dorothea deceived the police, telling them Ruth was depressed about her husband's terminal illness and that she was drinking heavily. The police believed Dorothea and ruled Ruth's death a s as the drugs in her system were her own prescriptions. Ruth's death didn't phase Dorothea one bit. She continued to meet men in bars and steal their pensions and to skim the benefit checks of her boarders. She had a plan to escape to Mexico with all the money, but she was caught before she could do that. She was arrested for only three of the dozens of fraud charges that she was still under investigation for. The judge did not consider these unfinished investigations or her previous convictions when he sentenced her. He was swayed by her service to the community and her grandmotherly act. She got a light sentence of five years in prison. Dorothea found a way to pass the time in prison. She joined a pen pal program and wrote letters to Everson Gilmouth, an elderly man in his early 70s. Everson was lonely and lost, and he fell for Dorothea's charm. He sent her money for the commissary, and they exchanged photos and promises. They made plans for when she was released. They dreamed of opening a new boarding house and getting married. Dorothea had found a new victim. Despite her criminal record, Dorothea did not lose the trust of the community she was helping. In fact, she was seen as a victim of the system, as the people she helped were often in and out of prison themselves. They sympathized with her and didn't forget how much she had helped them in the past. Part of her parole was that she couldn't run a boarding house anymore, but the social workers ignored this and sent her cases anyway. They believed she was providing a valuable service to the homeless and elderly, and that she had reformed herself. Everson was impressed with his bride-to-be and her reputation. He thought she was a kind and generous woman who had overcome many hardships. He didn't suspect that she was after his money and that she had a dark secret. But like Ruth, his health slowly started to mysteriously decline. He didn't realize that he was in grave danger. Dorothea soon had a big problem. She had killed Everson, and she needed to get rid of his body. She wrapped him up in sheets and plastic, hoping to hide the evidence. She may have looked like a sweet old lady, but she was only 56. But still, she wasn't strong enough to move a corpse by herself. She needed an accomplice. She found one in a former convict who knew how to work with wood. She hired him to build her a wooden box for her old books and to install some wood paneling. She paid him by giving him Everson's truck, which was almost new. She didn't tell him that the box was actually a makeshift coffin for her dead fiancé. She also asked him to help her transport her old books to a storage unit, but when they got there, she said she didn't want to keep the old books after all, and they just dumped the box on the side of the road. A fisherman would call police to report a coffin-sized box near the bank of a river. Meanwhile, Dorothea was busy forging letters to Everson's children, pretending that he was still alive and happy with her. She wanted to avoid any suspicion from his family. The police opened the box and found a decomposed body inside. They could not identify the body, but they did not have any fingerprints, dental records, or DNA to match it to Everson. Besides, he wasn't reported missing, as his children believed he was still alive and happy with Dorothea. His body was just another John Doe. There were a lot of people moving in and out of the boarding house. The nature of the case meant there was a high turnover. Dorothea kept stealing the benefit checks and depositing them into her own account, leaving the boarders with only a meager allowance. She pretended that she was helping them out, since most of them struggled with addiction and could not handle their finances. Sometimes she would tempt one of them with a little extra cash, knowing they would use it to buy drugs or alcohol. Then she would anonymously tip off the police, who would arrest them and lock them up for a little while. She would keep collecting their benefits while they were gone, then act like nothing happened when they returned. The social workers who sent the tenants to her were oblivious to her scheme, and were grateful she was willing to take in the most difficult cases. They never bothered to check in on her or the other tenants, and trusted Dorothea too much. Some of the elderly tenants would linger in Dorothea's boarding house, but she didn't like that. They occupied rooms that could be rented to more transient clients, 
who would bring in more benefit checks for her to skim. She wanted to get rid of them, but she didn't want to arouse suspicion. She hired a homeless man who was known to be violent and disturbed to be her personal handyman. He was a familiar face to the police in the community who thought that Dorothea was crazy to give him a job, but she had a sinister plan. She funded his drinking habit and in return he tended to her garden, but he was not just planting flowers and vegetables. He was also burying the bodies of her victims who died from poisoning, overdose, or neglect. Dorothea discovered that the basement was a better spot for her victims. She could kill them in their rooms and drag them downstairs without anyone noticing. She would bury them under the concrete floor and no one would ever find them. She lied to the neighbors that she was renovating the basement and that was why she had to move the dirt around. They never suspected that she was hiding a graveyard under their noses. She kept murdering and burying her tenants and collecting their benefits without any trouble. Her handyman, who had helped her with the burials, was also killed and buried in the basement. She told everyone that he had left without saying goodbye after getting his last paycheck. Bert was happy when Judy came to see him. She was nice and she helped him with the papers. She said he could get money from the government because he was born in Puerto Rico. He didn't understand what that meant, but he liked money. He wanted to buy snacks and books. Judy said he had to live in a new place where a lady named Dorothea would take care of him. She said it was a nice place with a pretty garden and a big kitchen. She said he would make friends there. Bert was scared, but he trusted Judy. She said she would visit him soon. She took him to Dorothea's boarding house and introduced him to her. Dorothea smiled and hugged him. She said he was welcome and she would give him a room. She said he could call her mama. Bert liked her. He thought she was kind. Judy was a volunteer who helped the less fortunate, and she had a soft spot for Bert. He had schizophrenia and developmental disabilities and could barely speak. She worked hard to get him the benefits he deserved, as he was born in Puerto Rico and was an American citizen. She had searched for a suitable place for him to live and was relieved when she found Dorothea's boarding house. Dorothea seemed eager to take him in, and she promised to look after him well. Judy trusted her, and she hoped that Bert would be happy there. When Judy visited Bert, she was amazed by the change in him. His hair was cut and his beard trimmed, and his nails were clean. He was helping Dorothea in the kitchen and the garden, and he looked cheerful and active. He was speaking in Spanish and even learned some English words, where before he was mostly silent. Judy thought that maybe he could get better with some medication and therapy, and she planned to take him to a doctor soon. She was so happy that she had found Dorothea's home and that Bert was doing so well. She didn't know that Dorothea was lying to her. She didn't know that Bert would soon join the other bodies in the basement. Dorothea took Bert to social services and claimed that she was his cousin. She said he had a disability and couldn't handle his money. She asked them to give her the power to manage his benefits. They agreed and they sent him to a doctor who confirmed his diagnosis of schizophrenia and developmental disability. The doctor prescribed him some medication, but Bert was afraid to take it. He didn't like the pills and he didn't trust the doctor. He thought they were trying to hurt him. Social services decided to make regular visits to check in on him. Bert loved Mama. She was good to him. She didn't make him take the yucky medicine that the doctor gave him. He hated the medicine. It made him feel sick and dizzy. He liked to help Mama cook in the kitchen. She taught him how to chop vegetables and stir soup. He liked to tend to the garden with her. She showed him how to dig holes and plant seeds. Mama said they would grow into big and beautiful trees. She gave him sweets to reward him for working so hard. He loved sweets. They made him happy. She would play records for him in her room. He liked the music. It made him calm. She would give him yummy things to drink. She had a special bottle that she said was good for him. He liked the drinks. They made him warm. But he got so tired, probably from working so hard in the garden. He couldn't keep his eyes open. One night, he was so tired that he fell asleep in Mama's bed. But Bert never woke up. Dorothea felt no remorse for killing Bert. He was one of her most lucrative tenants, and she cashed his benefits for months without raising any suspicion. 
She had poisoned him slowly and buried him in the hole that he had dug for the peach tree. She lied to the other tenants that he had left the house and put on a show of grief and despair. She said she missed her baby boy and sobbed. When Judy came to visit, Dorothea said that Bert was sick in bed, but she was taking good care of him and he'd recover soon. She hoped that Judy would go away and forget about Bert. She underestimated Judy's persistence. Judy was not convinced by Dorothea's story. She had a bad feeling that something was very wrong. She wanted to check up on Bert soon and see for herself that he was okay. But she was busy with her volunteer work and she couldn't visit him right away. She contacted Bert's social worker and asked her to check on Bert. The social worker called and visited Dorothea, but she got more and more elaborate stories from her. Dorothea said that Bert had gone to Mexico with his sister and he was having a great time. She said that he had sent them postcards and he would be back soon. The social worker asked Dorothea for some phone numbers, but Dorothea said she didn't have them. The social worker didn't believe her. She told Judy that she was calling the police to report Bert missing. Detective Cabrera was assigned to the case of Alvaro Montoya, a.k.a. Bert, a missing person who had been living in Dorothea Puente's boarding house. He visited the house and interviewed the tenants, but they all told him the same story. They said that Bert had left to live with his sister in Mexico and that he was happy and well. They said that Dorothea was a good landlord and that she cared for them like a mother. They seemed to have nothing but praise for her. Detective Cabrera was suspicious. He noticed everyone looked nervous and scared and that they avoided eye contact with him. He wondered if Dorothea had coached them to lie for her. He was right. One of the residents, a man named John, passed a note to the detective that read, she is making us lie for her. He slipped it into his hand when Dorothea wasn't looking. Detective Cabrera kept the note and thanked the tenants for their cooperation. He said he would be in touch if he had any more questions. He left the house, but he didn't go far. He kept his eye on the house and waited for an opportunity to talk to John again. He did not have to wait long. He saw John walking to the corner store to buy cigarettes. He followed him and approached him outside the store. John told the detective all sorts of stories about the holes in the garden and the basement and all the sick residents that disappeared overnight. He told them about all the checks that came in the mail and how Dorothea kept them for herself. Detective Cabrera looked into Dorothea's criminal history and he saw she had a recent conviction for fraud. He thought that this pointed to something sinister. He discovered that Dorothea was violating her parole by running the boarding house and he asked some parole officers to help him. In the house, they found drugs and books about medicine. They wondered what Dorothea was doing with them and if she was treating her tenants or if she was harming them. A rotten smell came from Dorothea's bedroom and they asked her about it. She claimed it was a dead rat and that she would dispose of it soon. She apologized for the smell and feigned embarrassment. Detective Cabrera asked Dorothea if they could dig in the garden. He expected her to make an excuse or to refuse, but she surprised him. She gave him her own shovel and said that he could dig wherever he wanted. Detective Cabrera took the shovel and walked towards the garden. He had a hunch that something was buried there, something that could lead him to Bert, the missing tenant. He started digging in a random spot, hoping to find some clues. He didn't have to dig too deep before he hit something hard. When he cleared the dirt, he saw a bone. It was a leg bone. He uncovered the foot, then the shoe, and felt a chill run down his spine. He looked at Dorothea, who was watching him from the porch. She gasped and covered her mouth with her hand. She acted as if she had no idea how a body could be buried in her yard. He knew that this wasn't Bert. Bert was only missing for a few weeks, and this body looked like it had been there for years. He called for backup and told them to bring a search warrant. He was going to search every inch of the house in the garden. He was going to find out the truth about Bert, but he underestimated Dorothea. Dorothea couldn't sleep as she laid in her bed, looking at the ceiling. The sound of police officers outside her house reached her ears, reminding her of the crime scene they were protecting. She knew they would dig up more bones in the garden, more evidence of her crimes. 
She needed to escape, but how? She had been careful, clever, cunning. She had fooled everyone, even the detective. She acted as a gentle and generous landlady who accepted elderly and disabled tenants and treated them like family. She showed shock and horror when they found the first body, pretending to be clueless about its origin. She cooperated fully with the investigation, letting them dig in her garden, hoping they would find nothing. But they did, and they wouldn't stop until they revealed all her secrets. Dorothea got out of bed and headed to her closet. She pulled out a bag and began to pack some clothes and personal items. She also snatched a stash of money that she hid under her mattress. She would need it to escape. Dorothea slept soundly and woke up the next day feeling refreshed. She dressed in nice clothes and carried a large purse. She wanted to look innocent and respectable. She greeted the detective when he showed up at her door. She asked him directly if she was under arrest. The detective told her she wasn't and even apologized for the disturbance to the house. He said they would get her a hotel to stay at and he would take her there himself. Dorothea smiled and thanked him. She pretended to be grateful and cooperative, but she had already packed her things. She had already planned her escape. When the detective dropped her off at the hotel and drove away, she took a taxi to the airport. There, she paid for a flight with cash and took the airport shuttle to the bus terminal. Boarding a bus to Los Angeles, she hoped to leave her past behind. She hoped to start over. She hoped to get away with murder. The following morning, Detective Cabrera arrived at the hotel, only to find the room deserted. He muttered a curse and dialed his partner's number. He ordered him to issue an APB on Dorothy Apuentes. He felt a pang of guilt, realizing he had unwittingly helped her escape. He hoped that he could still catch her before she vanished for good. The police revealed the scope of the horrors at the boarding house at a big press conference. They announced that their investigation had led them to discover seven bodies on her property. They stated that Dorothea was still on the run and that they were collaborating with the FBI and other agencies to locate her. They urged the public to be alert and report any sightings of Dorothea, who was considered armed and dangerous. They also expressed their condolences to the families of the victims and promised to bring her to justice. They described this as one of the most shocking and gruesome cases they had ever encountered and vowed not to rest until they caught Dorothea Puentes. Sacramento police are still looking for a boarding house manager they say literally dug an early grave for some of her tenants. Police say her motive was simple, money. As New Center 4 Stephanie Frederick reports, the neighbors knew something was wrong. Charles was at the Monte Carlo Tavern enjoying a drink. Feeling lonely, he started a conversation with a woman sitting at the bar. She was wearing nice clothes and looked attractive. He told her his name and asked for hers. Donna, she answered, smiling at him. Where have I seen her before, Charles wondered. He shrugged and smiled. He was just happy to have someone to spend time with. Charles got home and turned on the TV. Watching the news, he recognized a face on the screen. It was Donna, but that wasn't her real name. She was actually Dorothea, Dorothea Puentes, the serial killer who had poisoned and buried her tenants in her garden. The police were searching for her, and they warned that she was dangerous, that she would likely kill again. Charles was shocked and horrified. He had been deceived by a murderer. He quickly jotted down the tip line number on the TV screen and picked up the phone. A man who said he was from the TV station answered, I know where you can find Dorothea Puentes, he told the man. Dorothea's luck ran out the next day when the police tracked her down at the motel where she was staying. They surrounded the motel and arrested her without any resistance. She was handcuffed and escorted by two officers on a flight from LA back to Sacramento. She was booked in jail and charged with the murder of Alvaro Burt Montoya. She claimed that she was innocent, saying, I have not killed anyone. The checks I cashed, yes. I used to be a very good person at one time. No one believed her. Dorothea's trial was a media sensation, attracting national and international attention. She was dubbed as the Death House Landlady, the Killer Granny, and the Black Widow of Sacramento. The prosecution presented evidence that she was a cold-blooded and greedy killer who preyed on the vulnerable and the helpless. 
They showed that she had drugged, poisoned, and buried her tenants in her backyard, then cashed their social security checks for herself. They also exposed her as a master manipulator who charmed and deceived everyone around her. The defense tried to counter the prosecution's case by calling a lot of character witnesses who testified about Dorothea's contributions to the community. The defense also pointed out that Dorothea donated some of the stolen money to local charities and churches, and that she used it for maintaining the house that cared for so many people in need. She provided vulnerable people with food, shelter, clothing, and medical care. They argued that Dorothea was not a murderer, but a misguided benefactor. They asked the jury to spare her life. In a dramatic twist, the jury actually had a hard time reaching a verdict on Dorothea's case. After deliberating for 11 days, they told the judge that they were deadlocked on all nine counts, but he ordered them to resume their efforts to break the deadlock. On August 26, 1993, they finally reached a partial verdict. They convicted Dorothea on three counts of murder, Benjamin Fink, Leona Carpenter, and Dorothy Miller. However, they remained deadlocked on the other six cases, Ruth Monroe, Everson Theodore Gilmouth, Betty Mae Palmer, James Gallup, Vera Faye Martin, and Alvaro Gonzalez Montoya. When the trial moved to the penalty phase, the jury had to decide whether Dorothea should be sentenced to death or to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The jury was again split on the issue, and after several days of deliberation, they announced that they were deadlocked once again, which meant Puente was spared the death penalty. On December 10, 1993, she was sentenced by a judge to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. She was incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility, where she would spend the rest of her days. Dorothea Puente died in prison from natural causes on March 27, 2011. She was 82 years old. She never admitted to any of the murders and never expressed any remorse or regret. She continued to claim that she was innocent until the very end. She left behind a legacy of death, deception, and mystery. She also left behind a cookbook, a bizarre and disturbing testament to her twisted mind. The book was titled Cooking with a Serial Killer, and it was a bizarre and disturbing mix of biography, cookbook, and art. The book quotes the author as saying that, Dorothy has been accused of a lot of things, but being a bad cook isn't one of them. Dorothea herself had this to say, None of them were murdered. They died of natural causes. I couldn't do that anyhow. I'm not that type of person. I'm too caring and I worry too much about my people eating. Everyone can tell you that. Why would I spend money fattening them up if I was going to kill them? What do you think of Dorothy Puente and her crimes? How was it that she got away with it for so long? How did she manage to create such a web of lies and convince herself and others she was telling the truth? Would you ever try her recipes, or would you be afraid of what they might contain? Share your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. As always, you can get more involved by subscribing and discussing the cases in the comments. I try to reply to as many as I can. Continue watching the next video and we can explore another story hidden within the wrinkles in crime.